Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry and I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher X video. All right, today we're checking out a video that's doing really well from a channel I've never heard of. The channel's called Historically, it's got 86,000 subs, and the video's called The Shortest War Ever. All right, we'll see how they define what a war is. Our video link is going to be down below. Please, please, please support that. Check that video out. Do it if you like, subscribe to the channel. Let's get them more subs. Let's get them to 100,000. All right, here we go. All right, looks like we got an animated one. Always love animation. Here we go. Ooh, high quality animation too. We used all the, uh, the Salmonella clones. Wake up, mates. The war has begun. So quickly, man the cannons and what give war? them hell. Okay, it's British. War? Oh God. Okay, just give me a second. They gotta change it to my uniform, and I'll be I'll be right there. Okay. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. hey, Charles. Wait, why oh, aren't you guys manning the cannons? The cannons? They have no feet. What are you... Where's their feet? Oh, Where's their you feet? mean the war? I already finished it, matey. The war is over? Yeah, mate. Hey, you joining this round to what? This bloke is about to wager his soul. Ah, oh, bollocks. A deal's a deal, sir. No, wait, wait, wait. Who's that, Thatcher? Can I go Can to, I go bed, to again? bed again? Mm -hmm. Historically Facts, Part 5. Historically welcome facts, part to the five. late 19th century. Okay. And welcome to Great Britain. The land of industrial revolution, the land of Started economic there. opportunities, and the land of overcrowded yeah. cities. Yeah, those, uh, yeah, wealthy country, not so much for the citizens, man. Those living conditions were so bad. You had cholera outbreaks, thousands of people just die. Disgusting, polluted, ugh. Worst place to live, Victorian England. With many, many rats. You know what else Britain has many of? Colonies. How many? Very many. Approximately 22% of all of Earth's land area. It's the biggest empire that the, of the world has population ever seen. Too. And within that humongous empire is a small island called Zanzibar, just okay. off the coast of Tanzania. Zanzibar was the trade center of the Indian Ocean, connecting African, Indian and Asian traders all in one spot. Mm -hmm. This made the island crucial for the British colonists. Um, especially more important before the Suez Canal was built, right? Because you still had, you know, going around Africa. So islands like that, for sure, hook up. You got Indian Ocean Trade Network connecting to the Atlantic you know, trade network. As it strengthened their position they... in the African trading world. Creeping but me out. that wasn't the sole reason the British wanted the island. There was also slavery. No, 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 no. The British didn't want to establish it. They wanted to abolish it. Okay. Around the year 1800, the British had a change of heart and decided that maybe tearing families apart change and shipping them across the world to work till they die of exhaustion wasn't that humanitarian. Well, remember that slavery ended uh, <laughs> uh, the was 1830s uh, for Britain um, with the and, and the Industrial Revolution ended up re replacing it. So slave labor is decreasing its value as the Industrial Revolution is going up. Right. And it's starting to build by 1830s here for sure. And that type of labor um, was less and less needed. I know it's a little cynical point of view to say that when it, they're saying like they had a change of heart and stuff. Remember, it all still comes back to economics. Not going to end slavery without something to reproduce its productivity. So after a good old talk with abolitionists like Thomas Clarkson, Grenville Sharp and William Wilberforce, they decided that slaves are indeed also human and passed a law that made it illegal to have slaves in the Great British Empire. This simultaneously resulted in a new spark a lot of child in the hearts labor, of the British though. people. We shall free the world Extremely, of slavery uh, and have every man, work and later on maybe also women, made equal. This brings no, us back to Zanzibar. Turns out, just because the British quit slavery doesn't mean the local sultan and many traders settled in Zanzibar did themselves as well. And that was a problem profitable. for the British as slavery is very inhuman and not allowed because of the British law. Now, the easy way to deal with this problem a very is to immediately force- Take a very humanitarian view of this age of imperialism uh, because there was so much de bloody devastation to the rest of Africa during colonization. So what they end up doing is now, you gotta understand, um, Africa, Europeans have always wanted to, you know, colonize the interior of Africa. And it wasn't because they didn't want to, um, why it started happening in the 1800s. It's because industrialization brought, you know, countries like Britain and others over the hurdles that kept them from colonizing the interior of Africa. Okay. Steamships, uh, machine guns to fight against enemies. Um, that stuff's going to be happening. 
medicines that came along with the industrial revolution that helped against diseases and ailments that you could get um, in in uh, in Africa. So yeah, there was a lot of other very unhumanitarian things going on at this time period. So I don't know if that's a slant because he keeps kind of talking about like just the British became like really good people all of a sudden when there's all kinds of other horrific things going on outside of just slavery in the British Empire. Every trader and wealthy person on the islands to give up their main source of income so the islands would no longer be illegal. But that has a slight side effect of rebelling and guerrilla warfare. <laughs> And we wouldn't want to somehow end up in a war, would we? This brings us to the second, less rebellious option. Admiral Harry Rawson. Admiral Rawson was the chief of command at the Cape of Good Hope station in Southern Africa. Which meant that he was the head of the British fleet responsible for the waters around the African countries. What if instead of making slave trading illegal, we just sent multiple ships patrolling the seas around East Africa to intercept any incoming slave ships? effectively causing slave trading to come to a halt without coming across as evil colonists. I wonder if they intercepted other ships too, just like, you know, 19th century uh, um, piracy. Sounds like a smart plan, actually. But won't the local sultan oppose this? He would, if he could. When Britain acquired Zanzibar, it's not like they walked into the palace of the sultan, the sultan and said, of Omar hey man, lives in Zanzibar now. You remember that? Yeah, you're wondering, like, Sultan, that's an Islamic king. What are they doing down there by, like, Madagascar? Because, um, yeah, they uh, there was a big migration. There was a migration there coming from up north. Colony here so we can get richer. Do you consent to this very one-sided agreement? Or trade. No. It went more like this. Hey, Germany. Ah, scheiße. <clears throat> oh, Great Britain. I heard you're also trying to set up colonies in Africa. Yes, my dear friend. And I'll tell you what. If you take this part of East Africa, I'll take this, 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 and also this. Huh. If you refuse, I will use my superior naval force to make your life a living hell. Uh, you know, Vas, you make an outstanding argument. Deal. Oh, hello, okay. Sultan Hamad bin Tubaini. I own this island now. Any objections? You sure? Money talks. Okay, nice. But wait a minute. If the British seized ownership of the island, why is the Sultan still here? To once again avoid any unnecessary warfare, which we certainly wouldn't want to happen, they kept the Sultan in place to create the illusion that the Zanzibaris were still governed by their good old slave-loving Sultan. Though, oh, in reality, he was more like a yeah, puppet, puppet of the British to control the population. Now remember, that's how the British uh, had such a big empire and could financially do it and still rule it is they call it's called indirect rule so what you do is you find locals or you use locals you give them all kinds of power positions you know you go to them and don't just try to take away their kingdom but you know basically say hey you can keep your kingdom but you're gonna have to answer to us right and you'll get privileges it'll be like i scratch your back you scratch my back right and they did that and it was a lot more financially viable in a lot of parts of the world by the way it's the opposite of like the french the french did not like to do that they liked a lot more direct rule and there's pros and cons to both as long as the local sultan would listen to the british nothing bad would ever happen and he's dead how did he die Suddenly, aka probably poisoned by his cousin, oh, Khalid bin Bargash. Gosh, poisoned probably by a family thought he was, relative? They didn't like him we have pilot, never seen know. that before in history. All right, so yeah. the Sultan is dead, which means- It's like, if the case, you know, something that, that came to my mind, uh, Moctezuma, um, although it is a little bit not totally confirmed about how he died, um, Emperor of the Aztec Empire, whether it was by the hand of the Spanish or uh, the local uh, Tenochtitlan you know, citizens in the capital. Um, but one theory about that is uh, since they basically, the Spanish basically forced uh, Moctezuma to be a puppet pretty much. And the people didn't like that and revolted against him for not taking like a, a, a stronger stance against the Spanish and being exploited. And, and, you know, a common thing is that the people rioted and killed him um, as they were going to take out the Spanish as well. Since the British lost their puppet. Very upsetting. Not war-triggering upsetting, but still pretty bad. Time to get a new sultan elected. 
So they don't want to do it directly because it's too choices. expensive and requires We have Hamoud bin Mohammed, a pro-British anti-slavery candidate, or like a good candidate. Khalid bin Bargash, For them. the same dude who poisoned the previous sultan, and not to mention, really didn't like the British. What? So he's, a, he's the man of the people, though, the guy on the right. He's the man of the people. He doesn't want them to keep exploiting and ruling over that. It's imperialism, right? So it's like, obviously, the British are going to like the guy on the left, but the people are probably going to want the guy on the right. But you can't imagine that the British are going to be, you know, let that happen. Did he hate the British so much? Well, when Ali bin Said, the sultan before the poisoned one died, died, the British, just like now, had two choices. A pro-British, anti-slavery candidate, or Prince Khalid bin Bargash. Khalid was the only son of a previous sultan, which made him a prince and, in his opinion, the successor of the throne. The British didn't think so, and favored Hamid bin Tuwaini a lot more. Khalid really didn't like that, and the response to the British denying his sultanship stormed the palace and barricaded himself inside till the British gave him the throne. Luckily, the British managed to smooth talk their way to Khalid giving up the throne anyway, so unnecessary blood wasn't shed. But now, the same thing happened to Khalid again, and he wasn't about to let his sultanship be taken away for a second time. So, after hearing the British favored Hamoud bin Mohammed over him, he once again, though now with over 3,000 men and women, stormed the palace and locked themselves inside. Exactly what I expected. The British happen. initially tried to once again sweet talk Khalid into leaving the palace. But Khalid had enough of the British and flat out ignored them this time. Oh. This was extremely problematic for the colonizer, as they had to get a sultan in power that aligned with their ideals. After asking Khalid to leave Sounds again, like presumably now with a bouquet Bring of flowers, the, CIA. the British turned back to Admiral Harry Rawson. Oh, so, yes yeah, sir, this bloke in the palace is not getting out. You think maybe you could somehow convince him to leave? Yeah, no worries mate. I got you. I'll be right there first thing in the morning, and uh, for no reason whatsoever, please evacuate all British citizens and merchants from the island, okay? See you yeah, tomorrow. Bomb the crap out of the Oi, mate. Oh, my name gosh. is Harry, and those are my five ships. We give you one final hour to leave, or we will do it the good old fashioned way, alright? Whereas Khalid responded, and I quote, We have no intentions of leaving, and we do not believe you would open fire on us. Oh, I'm not sure. All right. <laughs> Somebody give this guy a page of out of a book of British history, okay? <laughs> Color claims a bluff, mate. One final hour. Do not be a hero. So back to his ships Harry went, waiting for Khalid and his 3,000 supporters to leave the palace. But as time grew closer to 9am, there were no signs of surrendering. Instead, the British noticed the Zanzibari rebels mm. manned the one shore battery they had, Sorry, and just... that a Zanzibari warship began to position itself within the formation of the five ships. That's Very suicide, questionable though. behavior. I sure wonder why they are doing that. Oh hey, would you look at the time. It's time for... <laughs> the gunboats so Raccoon, Trush, and Sparrow simultaneously opened fire at the palace, where Trush's first what shot ship, immediately though? destroyed the only manned shore battery they had. The Even though feet. the 3,000 supporters oh, heavily fortified themselves in the palace, the British high explosive shells obliterated the barricades and caused massive fires throughout the palace, trapping thousands of supporters in the toxic smoke. Ooh. At 5 past 9 a.m., so three minutes after the shelling started, the only warship of the Zanzibaris started to lay fire onto the big cruiser that Admiral Rawson was on. Okay, this is... Okay, was this literally a suicide mission? They're going in the middle of this British formation of <coughs> battleships? Like, that's what I'm wondering here. I was wondering at first, was it like a distraction or something like that? But no, these guys actually have intentions of... Fighting. Due to the very outdated weaponry and yeah. questionable battle ethics, they didn't even manage to create a dent in the ship's hull. Oh the St. George laid fire back and sunk the enemy ship in approximately four shots. For some reason, a couple minutes okay, later, two small steam launches came to try to take down Trush, but they did it with rifles? What? Needless to say, they were disposed of really quickly oh, as well. I, I respect and the... that was all the naval defenses that the Zanzibaris had. The, the, yeah, what followed was 30 had. minutes of over 500 high explosive their, their shells land. continuously fired upon the palace. Till one brave Zanzibari climbed up Let to the flag. roof to take down the rebellers' flag. And then the war ended. 
Yep, the entire war. The shortest war in history. Ended in just 38 minutes. With over 500 casualties on the Zanzibari side. Jeez. And only one sailor hurt on the British side. <laughs> presumably by accidentally dropping a shell on his own foot. <laughs> in the end, the Anglo-Zanzibar War was the shortest and one of the most one-sided wars in our entire history. Wait a minute. What happened to Khalid? Well, he ran off. Five minutes into the shelling, he just left with Five his minutes. rich buddies and sought refugee well, at the German for, embassy, literally dying leaving his thousands of supporters to die in the palace. Bro, uncool. Yeah. <laughs> After the war, Khalid fled to the German side of Africa, where he continued to live an easy life. Till he got captured by the Allies, who were liberating and possibly trying to take more for themselves in Africa from the Germans in World War One, and got sent to exile to yeah, the same British island. British really wanted. Let me go back to the map so you guys can understand a little bit of context of why Tanzania is involved in uh, World War One. All right, hard to tell on this map, but the colonies north of Tanzania. So Tanzania is right here, right? Uh, hard to see on the map with my cursor. North of our little guy here, there is a string of colonies connected all the way to Cairo, which the British are going to rule. And then below, south of Tanzania, there's a string of, of colonies that go all the way to South Africa. Um, the British were especially interested in Tanzania because if they could do that, if they could take that over, they would have a complete connection of African colonies from the north of the continent all the way to the south. So literally from the Mediterranean to you know, the south, to the, to the south of the continent. And they actually had plans to build a, a trans-African continental railroad through there. So that was one of the reasons the British were very interested there. After the war, Khalid fled to the German side of Africa, where he continued to live in Egypt, take more for themselves in Africa from the Germans in World War I, and got sent to exile to the same island that they sent Napoleon to, where Saint Khalid Helena? wrote and sent dozens of personal letters to that. Churchill begging to be sent home. Oh, wow. So they, okay, so that's in San Helena. That's in the South Pacific. That's West of Africa. Or sorry, South Atlantic, not Pacific, South Atlantic. And I guess that makes sense because it was a very good place. It is one of the most remote islands in the world. Look up St. Helena if you haven't seen that. And yeah, it makes a perfect spot to basically exile somebody because there's no escape. So like Elba, which is so close to the uh, the the European coastline that you could easily you know break out and get there. Like there's no getting out um, of there. But I had no idea that they used it a, a, again for an, another you know leader. Whereas the Sigurdman responded by sending him to Kenya, where he died. Epic troll. Anyway, oh 20 minutes after the war ended, Hamoud bin Mohammed ascended to become a sultan and slavery was forever abolished in Zanzibar. This is the bizarre 38 minutes war that caused way, way too many deaths. <laughs> All right, final thoughts. All right, always love seeing new history channels. It's great and they're animated. Obviously, it makes them a lot more fun to tell all these stories because literally the historical record has an infinite amount of amazing stories that we could just be telling for the rest of our lives. And it's great that these channels um, are, are having success like this one is. Um, this has got a ton of views and I'm glad for that. And I hope to keep promoting channels like this that are really doing this um, and, and keep it, keep it growing that way. All right, so this is a great story. Tell me what you think about it and we'll see y'all next time.